Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the University of Manitoba Alumni and Friends Virtual Learning for Life program. My name is Tracy Bowman. I'm the Director of Alumni Relations and a proud UM alumna. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that the University of Manitoba campuses are located on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, OG Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Thank you everyone for being here with us today, making from wherever you are joining us around the world. This is our fourth virtual learning for life series that we've been able to offer at the University of Manitoba to our alumni and friends around the world since the start of the global pandemic. We've seen great interest in this program. We see people looking at our and viewing our sessions from previous, from previous years over the last two years uh, again and again, and we encourage you to do that. There's a lot of content, nearly 30 presentations on our website. So we encourage you to do that, share with friends and family, as uh, there's a lot of wonderful expertise amongst your alumni and UM scholars. We're able to offer this program free of charge to all of our alumni and friends, thanks to our, the wonderful and generous sponsorship of our affinity partner, IA Financial Group. Many thanks to them. You can learn more about the insurance op options for alumni on our website as well. So before we get started and I introduce today's speaker, just a few housekeeping details. Today's session is being recorded and we will share it with you as I've mentioned, as well it will be posted on our website for you to view as many times as you like in the months and days ahead. Uh, we also sent you the link for slido.com. That is the platform that we use if you're wanting to ask questions. So that's slido, so www.slido.com and the password is VLFL16. And so you can just easily type in your questions. I encourage you to bring that up in your browser right now. So if something strikes you right now, you can ask a question and we'll be waiting uh, in the background to facilitate that. So uh, please ask as many questions as you'd like and we'll try to get through them all throughout the session at the end at the end of our presentation. So now I'm delighted to introduce today's presenter, Dr. Gordon Goldsboro. He is an aquatic ecologist in the Department of Biological Sciences in the University of Manitoba's Faculty of Science, where he researches the impacts of humans and invasive species on wetlands and lakes. He's also a passionate Manitoba historian, being president and webmaster of the Manitoba Historical Society and an editor of Prairie History Magazine. He has mapped thousands of historic sites around the province and has written four books on Manitoba history, including two national bestsellers, Abandoned Manitoba and More Abandoned Manitoba. And you can also check him out in his weekly series on the weekend morning show of CBC Radio One. Dr. Goldsboro also, uh, we're very excited about this within the UM community, was recently named on May the 12th to the Order of Manitoba for all of his amazing work that he does to support his research in the community. And as you know, the Order of Manitoba is the province's highest honor. So with that, over to you, Dr. Goldsboro. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. I, uh, you know, I should point out, I guess, that I was here speaking with, uh, uh, in this series about a year ago. And it's, uh, I guess, amazing to think about how much can things can change in just a year. Uh, last year, when I was here, I spoke about my work mapping historic sites around the province. And uh, well, today, in the immortal words of Monty Python, it's time for something completely different. <laughs> so instead of talking about my historical work, I'm going to turn and talk about my scientific research, uh, focusing on freshwater coastal wetlands. Um, that I've been working on with my with my students and several of my colleagues over at least the last uh, 25 years or so. And uh, the emphasis of my presentation today is going to be on our efforts to restore the Netley Lebo Marsh. And we're preparing to undertake a massive restoration project for it. And I emphasize preparing, uh, as you'll see a little bit later in the presentation, why I use that word, preparing to, to restore. Okay, I just need to advance my slide here now. Let's just get back underway. Okay, so I guess the first thing I should address is what is a freshwater coastal wetland, since that's the premise of my presentation. Well, essentially, it is a large wetland that is associated with a large lake. And in this particular photo, for instance, it's uh, Lake Winnipeg on the right-hand side, 
And to the left is the, uh, the Netley Lebo Mars that I'm going to be talking about a little bit later. Essentially, in this case, it is a marsh that is dominated by emergent plants. That's sort of the defining element of what makes a specific kind of wetland a marsh. A marsh, in other words, is a subset of all of the various kinds of wetlands that exist around the world. Now, these are plentiful here in Manitoba. In fact, arguably, we have more coastal wetlands in Manitoba than any other place on the continent. And uh, here, for example, are the three large lakes that we have, Lake Winnipeg, Lake Winnipegosis, Lake Manitoba, three of the largest lakes. In fact, I often refer to them as the Manitoba Great Lakes. Uh, a few years ago, uh, we mapped the locations of the coastal wetlands around them. And if you look closely, you can see the colored areas that denote the various coastal wetlands. Uh, just to give you a couple of examples, Grand Beach, uh, where many of us like to spend time in the summer is an example of a coastal wetland of Lake Winnipeg. Likewise, the Netley Lebo Marsh, same thing. In fact, if you look closely at all of these various colored areas, at the bottom end, at the south end of Lake Manitoba, we have Delta Marsh, and at the south end of Lake Winnipeg, we have the Netley Lebo Marsh. So uh, two of these large wetlands, the two that I'm gonna focus on today uh, are associated with the south ends of two of our large lakes here. And uh, it, this is a far in excess of anything you see anywhere else on the continent. And in fact, this is already an underestimate because it excludes a category called treed muskeg at the north end of Lake Winnipeg. If you add that, then the numbers go up by about five times. So we say we have lots of these things here in Manitoba and uh, they are under threat. Just bear with me here. I'm just trying to get my slide to advance properly. Oh, come on here, you. There we go. So I always like to start with, with a bit of history. And in this case, I want to emphasize that, that coastal wetlands are valuable. You know, people traditionally, sometimes at least, have viewed them as wastelands, places that are really have no value whatsoever. Well, this photo taken around Gimli in about 1920 uh, illustrates one of the uses, one of the economic uses for coastal wetlands, where farmers would go into them, harvest some of the natural vegetation there, and bring it back to their farms for the benefit of their, their livestock. In other words, it was a useful source of food. It was hay for their animals. Uh, we've learned over the last number of years that there are all sorts of other uses of natural vegetation uh, for biofuels and a variety of other things that I won't talk about today. They're also useful, these coastal wetlands, as habitat whether it's for the various fish that populate the lakes, so the spawning, the feeding of these commercially important fish like, like uh, pickerel, they spend quite a bit of their time, particularly in their early days, in these coastal wetlands. Likewise, waterfowl like ge uh, geese and ducks uh, spend time in these coastal wetlands. We know that the vegetation of the wetlands help in stabilizing shorelines. And of anyone who's experienced one of the ferocious storms on Lake Winnipeg knows just the power of wave action. Well, vegetation can counteract that wave action. And then finally, we have a lot of new information over the last number of decades that wetlands really can be seen as nature's kidneys. They, they help to purify, in other words, some of the contaminants that exist in water. And if we have, for example, water running off the landscape into a lake, as it passes through coastal wetlands, it can be improved in water quality. So there are some tangible economic benefits. Uh, on the other side of the coin, however, there are some factors that cause damage to coastal wetlands. This photo that I took a few years ago on the east side of Lake Winnipeg, this is south of Victoria Beach. Victoria Beach is in the background here. Uh, we see in the in middle part of the photo, there's a nice little coastal wetland that drains out into the lake. And in the foreground, there is a residential development complete with manicured lawns and nice lush greenery and a, and a marina. Well, inevitably, of course, that has impacts on the coastal wetland and its, its, its uh, ecosystem. There's a host of impacts that we could talk about. And I, and I do talk about when I teach my, uh, my course in wetland ecology, uh, but we'll have to suffice with just a few photos to illustrate. But I do want to talk about the last one just for a moment because it helps to illustrate the work we've been doing in restoring some of these impacted coastal wetlands. Specifically, I wanna talk about an invasive species called the common carp. Carp are not native to North America. They were introduced here in Manitoba, we think, 
sometime in the 1880s. They didn't begin to flourish, however, until the 1940s. Um, this is work, these maps that I'm showing you right now were the work of one of my former graduate students, Dr. Pascal Badju, that I am showing you a picture of here. He's showing, shown holding a carp. You can see they're pretty big muscular fish. And through the decades, they have managed to distribute themselves pretty much everywhere they can swim around the province. And so what we see here are uh, the, the places where we find carp today. And we find, for example, that they are even as far north as Churchill and at the mouth of the Nelson River. So they basically anywhere they can swim is where they can, you can now find carp occurring. They are, unfortunately, a very destructive fish. They are what's called a benthivore, meaning they feed on material they find in the bottom sediment of a water body. But in the process of collecting their food, they cause a lot of sediment to be suspended. And therefore, they cause the water to become incredibly murky. And that, in turn, causes the death of the vegetation in the water, which then has a whole series of cascading effects on the ecosystem of the wetland. So we know, for example, that at Delta Marsh, that I'm showing you in this photo, uh, the carp arrived in sometime in the early 1950s, based on observations from some of the locals. They started seeing the carp present in the marsh about that time. Incidentally, Delta Marsh at the south end of Lake Manitoba is the second largest freshwater coastal marsh in North America uh, at 18,500 hectares. It, it, it dwarfs virtually all of the coastal wetlands around the other Great Lakes, what we could call the Laurentian Great Lakes, uh, by a substantial margin. And it was essentially formed when the southernmost part of Lake Manitoba was cut off by what was called a barrier beach. And, and say, so about for the last 70 years or so, carp have been present in Delta Marsh. Well, I began and became involved in research at Delta Marsh back when I was a graduate student. And I've continued to work at Delta Marsh for a number of decades now. And about 25 years ago, we began doing work on means by which we could restore the Delta Marsh. The carp had become so numerous that the vegetation had dramatically declined. And so we thought, well, one way perhaps to see an improvement in the quality of the marsh would be to exclude the carp. So we did what we called a small scale carp exclusion. You can see it shown here. It's a culvert basically with a screen over it. The bars of these uh, screen essentially prevent the largest fish from passing through. And that's what we see in the foreground, incidentally. Those are all carp milling around, trying their darndest to get through that culvert and, and not being able to because of the screen. And you know, the, the improvement we saw was remarkable. I, I was encouraging everybody to be modest in their expectations because I feared that the, the decline in the marsh had happened over decades. I, I feared that the recovery would likewise take decades. And therefore, I was quite heartened to see that within weeks, we began seeing dramatic improvement. Uh, for example, we began seeing a dramatically clearer water in the marsh, which in then turn caused all sorts of vegetation to grow back. And, uh, and I'll show you just in a moment the sort of things that we see when we get vegetation growing back. But on the basis of that successful experience, we then uh, went big. So we went from a small scale carp exclusion to what we believe is probably the largest carp exclusion ever carried out anywhere on the planet uh, by excluding carp from the entirety of Delta Marsh. Previously, we'd only done it for small areas of the marsh. As of the winter of 2012, when we constructed seven structures like the one I'm showing you here, uh, we were able to exclude carp, at least for the most part, for certain parts of the year from the entirety of the marsh. Uh, unfortunately, it was a rather expensive proposition uh, to build all these structures, but we feel that this is going to have long-term benefits for the health of the marsh. Incidentally, that structure that I just showed you had uh, bars in it, like, like the ones we had on that culvert. In this case, however, the bar spacing was a little bit wider. It was seven centimeters, and we had determined based on measurements of fish in the marsh that this would be wide enough to permit the majority of the fish going into the marsh to do so, while being, uh, being close enough together so as to exclude the majority of the most destructive carp, the biggest, most muscular carp. Uh, there's other factors that went into the, to the operation of these structures, but this gives you sort of the basics of how they work. By putting in these screens at a certain time in the spring and then removing them again a little later in the summer, 
uh, we can successfully exclude the majority of the carp from the marsh. And uh, you, the results are pretty, imp pretty impressive, pretty dramatic. This is a photo taken by one of my colleagues, Dale Robleski at Ducks Unlimited Canada. Uh, here he's looking down into the water from one of those structures, and you can see the, the uh, fish milling around, trying their best to get into the marsh and, and sailing. Well, of course, the abundance of fish would inevitably draw the interest of other things as well. Uh, another one of my colleagues in this project, Doug Watkinson from the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, took another photo at one of the structures, this one. And I have to say, this is one of the most dramatic pictures that I think I've ever seen associated with our project. It shows a vast number of white pelicans milling around at the entrance to the structure where they hope to acquire a few fish, because, of course, pelicans are fish eating birds. Uh, and in fact, one of the interesting observations we came across was that there were a few cases where the, where the birds were so voracious in their appetite that a few of them choked to death from eating too many fish that it clogged their throats and they died, which I think proves that essentially humans are not the only gluttonous species, that, uh, that unfortunately white pelicans are up there as well. Uh, but the response by the vegetation in the marsh was dramatic. In fact, by August of 2017, when I took this photo, the water was full of vegetation. Vegetation that, as a biologist, I had not seen in my entire time at Delta Marsh. Not in this abundance, not in this diversity, and uh, it was, was quite encouraging to see. It did have a downside, though, I have to say which is that it made it much more difficult to travel around the marsh. We ended up having to use uh, boats that had motors above the water simply because the, uh, the boats with motors in the water clogged almost immediately on the abundant vegetation. But it had all sorts of other benefits as well. It wasn't simply in terms of the vegetation. We also saw a dramatic increase in the use of the marsh by birds. Uh, so, for example, my colleague Frank Baldwin at the time was working for the provincial uh, government, did a census of canvasback ducks, one of the many uh, duck uh, species that occur in the marsh. And they had at one time been numerous in Delta Marsh. Back in the 1960s and 70s, they were one of the more abundant birds in the marsh. Uh, they declined as the marsh declined. So when you go through the 70s and 80s and 90s and 2000s, their numbers were sporadic and low. Fortunately, though, since the structures have been installed, we've seen a dramatic increase in the number of canvasbacks. So it's an encouraging sign that you can restore damage to a coastal wetland. And so that's ultimately uh, what our hope is, that the work we can do can in some way benefit the natural ecosystem. And then perhaps that if it also has economic benefits, then all the better. So I want to turn now and continue the presentation on the Netley Lebo Marsh. I'll spend most of my time talking about it here. As I mentioned before, it is at the south end of Lake Winnipeg. And just as Delta Marsh is the second largest coastal wetland on the continent, the Netley Lebo Marsh is the largest coastal wetland on the continent at 22,000 hectares. Um, it is at the mouth of the Red River. Oh, hang on a second. It's getting a delivery here. Listen, maybe we should just try it out to make sure it works. Just bear with me a moment, please. Like it. it plugged in, hasn't fried anything. Uh, I've got the screen full screen doing a presentation, so I can't really check it. So I'll be done at about one o'clock, two o'clock. Yep. I'll wait here. Sure thing. Yeah, thank you. Had a little bit of a had a little bit of a, a hardware problem here, but I think we've got it fixed. Um, anyway, so this is at the mouth of the Red River, where it flows out into Lake Winnipeg. And there are two complexes in this marsh. The east part of the east of the Red River is known as the Lebo Marsh. West of the Red River is referred to as the Netley Marsh. So we just refer to the whole thing collectively as the Netley Lebo Marsh. Huge marsh. And uh, in fact, also like Delta Marsh, subject to degradation. But unfortunately, not quite the same as Delta Marsh. Uh, we do know what the marsh used to look like. And that's how we can assess the changes that have occurred. We have a collection of remarkable photographs that were taken in 1923, some aerial photographs. Uh, some of the earliest air photos, in fact, taken anywhere 
And uh, they show us what the, Del what the Netley Marsh used to look like at that time. It was what we wetland scientists call a hemi marsh, hemi as in half. And the idea is that it was, it was a dispersed uh, emergent vegetation that was intermixed with open patches of water. In fact, in the foreground of this picture, you can see a classic example of hemi marsh. This is considered ideal habitat for uh, waterfowl and other marsh animals. And uh, much of the Netley Lebo Marsh was hemi marsh. So it was a very productive, very healthy marsh. Lots of emergent vegetation and therefore lots of animal life as well. Well, unfortunately, time has not been kind to the Netley Lebo Marsh. Uh, in this photograph that uh, we, we compiled back in 2001 of the marsh, uh, I'm showing you in the white rectangle an area in the northern part of the Netley Marsh known as Netley Lake. And uh, it used to be at one time one of the more well-vegetated parts of the marsh. Uh, in fact, let me just take this, this area, this rectangular area, and zoom in as to how it looked in 1979. This is a vegetation map. The various colors denote the various species of uh, emergent vegetation that were present at that time. And I think as you can see here, that there were a number of bodies of water. Uh, there were emergent vegetation in between them and there were some channels. There was the Red River flowing through the middle as you can kind of see off to the right. And there was something called the Salamonia uh, over to the left. Well, unfortunately, when we remapped this area back in 2001, uh, you can see a dramatic change, that in fact, a lot of the emergent vegetation has been lost. That Salamonia channel, in fact, is all but gone. So the net result is we've lost a lot of the vegetation, the emergent vegetation from the Netley Lebo Marsh. And this is the, the uh, change that we hope to reverse with our restoration. Well, I guess the first thing to address then is what has caused these changes. And uh, we don't think there's any one factor that has contributed to it. It's probably a combination of several, and at least four, uh, that I'll just give you a little bit of background about. So I'm going to enumerate each of these four and just show you a little bit more about each one, starting with the first one, the oldest one that we think began in about 1913 with the dredging of something called the Netley Cut. Now, uh, one thing that you, you may not know is that the Red River has been the subject of dredging by the federal government since the 1880s. You know, since, you know, over a hundred years ago, the federal government was dredging the river. And this is one of the dredges that they used on the Red River to facilitate navigation. Because of course, at that time, there were lots of vessels. There were ships that were plying up and down the Red River, out into Lake Winnipeg, around the lake. And a lot of the commerce that was supported around Lake Winnipeg was supported by the dredging. The dredging made possible the ships going up and down the Red River. Well, the dredging that was done, say, by the federal government uh, wasn't confined to any one particular place. There was one place that was a little more common, and I'll show you that in just a moment. But one of the uh, impacts, one of the places where dredging was done was at the south end of that Netley Lake that I showed you in that previous photograph. So here's another one of those remarkable 1923 aerial photos of the marsh. This is looking south, uh, and the Red River here is in the, is in the foreground, kind of snaking its way off to the background. Uh, and on the right-hand side, you can see the south end of Netley Lake. And again, you see that wonderful Hemi Marsh. But you can also see that there is a channel leading from the Red River out into the south end of Netley Lake. This was dredged in 1913, and it was called the Netley Cut. Now, when we began doing some research at Netley Marsh, uh, we began driving, uh, uh, flying around the marsh in planes just to get an idea of the overall look from the air. So this photo was taken uh, 80 years later, after that photo that I just showed you. Now that photo, by the way, is in 1923, so this would be 2003, this photo. And uh, what it shows is a very different situation. You can still see that you know, river sneaking off into the background. Uh, you can see the south end of Netley Lake, but one of the things that is conspicuously absent is, of course, Hemi Marsh. It's basically all gone. That channel, that narrow channel that we saw in that previous photo from 1923, is now a much wider channel. And in fact, this particular year, 19, or pardon me, 2003, was a low water year. And that's why if you look just a little bit to the right of the Netley Cut, you can see a lot of material being deposited 
that is exposed. And actually, that's not normal. That's not, it doesn't happen terribly often that you see that material. It's only because the water levels were especially low that year that we see all of that uh, exposed material. But I'll come back and talk a little bit more about that shortly. Uh, this is a map that we compiled in 2011 uh, of the marsh. We had a, a bathymetric survey carried out. Basically, it's a survey of the bottom contours of the marsh. The different colors denote different depths of water. So the darker the blue, the deeper the water, and the, the lighter the color. When you get up into the yellows and the reds, uh, the shallower the water. So in fact, in this, this particular view, you can see that there is that red area that you just saw a moment ago. You can see that just next to the Netley Cut. The Netley Cut shows up as dark blue. In other words, deep water through there because of the erosion that has occurred from water flowing through that Netley Cut. And uh, it's the deposition of material caused by that water flowing in has caused those two red areas to appear north of the Netley Cut. So we'll come back and talk about those again because they're another part of the story here. But I want to show you this data. This is from some measurements taken by one of my colleagues here at the university, uh, Dr. Sean Clark. He's an engineering professor uh, in the uh, Faculty of Engineering. And uh, he and his students measured the volume of flow that is going through various channels uh, of the Netley Marsh. And this was taken on the 3rd of July, 2019. So basically about two years ago. Uh, what it shows is that you have started below the Netley Creek, in other words, at the bottom of this picture, with 100% of the river flow, and then the various percent numbers above that represent the percentage of the total that has been filtered off going in the various directions. And what you see, therefore, is that the single biggest number is going up through the Red River Channel, out through one of the channels out into Lake Winnipeg, 34% of the flow. So roughly one-third is going out that way. Uh, about another quarter is going out through the eastern channel out into Lake Winnipeg. Uh, but then if you look at the next biggest number, it is the Netley Cut at 21%. In fact, uh, Dr. Clark and his students have found that depending on the day, depending on the direction of the wind and other factors, there could be as much as 40% of the Red River flow going through the Netley Cut. And this is having impacts on the, uh, on the hydraulics of the marsh. Uh, it also, of course, brings in all sorts of contaminants contained in the water of the Red River. So that's one factor is the dredging of the Netley Cut uh, in 1913. I will have more to say about that date, 1913, a little bit, uh, in a, a little bit later. Second factor is the lack of periodic low values on Lake uh, Winnipeg and correspondingly on the Netley Lebo Marsh since at least the 1970s. Now, this graph shows water levels on Lake Winnipeg. Uh, I obtained this graph from Manitoba Hydro, and it represents the period from 1913 to 2019. And what it shows is the period pre-regulation, before Manitoba Hydro began regulating Lake Winnipeg for hydroelectric power production, you can see that there were marked oscillations in the level of the lake. The red periods illustrate periods when the lake was lower than the long-term average. The blue are areas times when it was above the long-term average. And there's, a, there's an amplitude here that's measured in, uh, uh, in feet above sea level. It's about on the range of about six feet or about two meters of amplitude. And so there were prolonged periods, for example, in the 1920s. There were prolonged periods in the 1930s when the water levels were low, again in the late 1950s. And then there were also periods when it was higher than average. So, for example, uh, in the late 1940s, early 1950s, and then again in the mid to late 1960s, early 1970s, it was higher. Since that time, however, since 1976, when Manitoba Hydro began regulating the lake, the amplitude of the variation has diminished. In fact, you can see that, I think, from this graph. The times that the water is low are shorter, and the, the height of the water at those low periods is higher. In other words, it is not quite as low as it traditionally would have been. Traditionally, it went down as low as perhaps in the range of about 710. Uh, now it's something about 711, 711 and a half even. Uh, so the, you get lower or you get higher lows, in other words. Likewise, the highs aren't as near as, as high either. Well, there's a number of explanations for this that are, may occur. And it, in other words, I'm not suggesting that this is solely a phenomenon of Lake Winnipeg regulation. That is certainly one of the contributing causes, potentially. But it could also relate to another two things. One is the possibility that we are in a wet climatic cycle. 
Uh, some of my uh, my uh, meteorological colleagues uh, say that the uh, rainfall that has been occurring in the Red River Valley, for example, uh, through this period has been higher than normal, and that, of course, has led to regular runoff. So, you know, understandably, then, that this would raise the water level in the river, in the Red River, and then correspondingly raise the level of Lake Winnipeg. Uh, there is also the, a, a, the case that much of the Red River Valley is being actively drained in the name of agriculture, specifically the installation of tile drainage, which is widespread, and simply the drainage of, of, of sloughs, natural water bodies throughout the, the river valley has caused greater runoff in the spring, which in turn has caused greater flooding potentially in the spring as well. And that of course brings more volume of water into the lake. So it may say it's a number of factors that potentially contributes whatever that cause is, but it does have measurable impact. So to illustrate why we need low water levels on a, to have a healthy marsh, I'll go back to Delta Marsh for just a moment and show you a pair of photographs. This is what one part of the Delta Marsh looked like in 2001, an area we call Clandeboy Bay, over on the extreme east side of the marsh. This is what it looked like in 2001, 2003, during a drought year, two years later, and you see vast amounts of vegetation that have reestablished. In other words, there were seeds present. In fact, there is something called the seed bank present in soil, and there are vast numbers, millions of seeds in the soil that are simply awaiting appropriate conditions to germinate. And one of the things they require is low water to give them exposure to sunshine, and away they go, and therefore you need periodic low water to cause renewal of vegetation. In the absence of low water, there is no renewal of vegetation and you lose vegetation, as we seem to be seeing at the Netley Lebo Marsh. So let's come back again to the Netley Lebo Marsh. Here is that same area I showed you earlier. It's an area that we call Hardman Lake, and I'll talk about it again in a few minutes. This is what it looked like in 2001 on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side is that, again, that drought year in 2003. The red corresponds to areas of vegetation. And you just have to look side to side and see the dramatic increase in vegetation that occurred in 2003. It was perhaps a disaster for those who were dependent on water for farming and other purposes, but it was a very good development for the vegetation in the marsh. And one of the things that I felt quite keen about was what would it mean to the long-term maintenance of the vegetation? Well, I'm, I'm glad to say that the, the increase in vegetation that occurred in 2003 was sustained. So one of my former graduate students, Elise Watchorn, she's now at Environment and Climate Change Canada, uh, put together some data on the extent of vegetation in the marsh using aerial photographs. And uh, we actually have a paper coming out in the Journal of Great Lakes Research, a special issue on the health of Lake Winnipeg uh, shortly. And this is one of the figures from that paper that shows the extent of the vegetation in the marsh. Basically, well, actually the, the Y axis, the vertical axis here, represents the open water area of the marsh, which is actually the inverse of the vegetation. When the open water area is high, the vegetation is correspondingly low. So what we see through the 90s is a dramatic loss of vegetation. The open water area is increasing rapidly. Then through the late 90s, early 2000s, it's kind of continuing to decrease as the, uh, the water level is, in, as the uh, uh, open water area is increasing. Then we get that 2003 drought, which causes, again, the dramatic increase in vegetation. In other words, the decrease in open water area. And I, and I say, I was curious to see what would happen after the, after the flooding. And I'm, I'm pleased to say that it did not all disappear again. That although there, we did lose some of the vegetation, you can see the open water area did increase again. We did lose some vegetation. We didn't lose all of it. So what it illustrates is that a single year of low water was sufficient to restore vegetation. And this is why we advocate for lower water periodically. So uh, come back again to that Netley cut. Here we have another view of it from 2019. We can see there's sort of a, a dendritic pattern of erosion, uh, water from the Red River flowing into the south end of the Netley Marsh, forming these sort of three sort of forks of, of a discharge. And then on the north side of that Netley cut, remember those, those two red areas that were just north of the Netley cut? They're back. In other words, there's an area of deposition there. 
Well, that area, this circular area, is, is I think, quite interesting in revealing what can happen when you get low water. So we were out there in 2019. Uh, this is Pascal Badiou again, the fellow who did the work on the carp at Delta Marsh. Uh, and uh, we found there was dramatic colonization. There were hosts of various wetland species. Of course, our friends, the common cattails, were there. But what was I found quite heartening was that we found also some sort of amphibious and sort of semi-terrestrial species like willows and cottonwoods that were about a meter tall that were already starting to establish themselves. And what's encouraging about that is that it, it fosters the accretion of sediment, which can then rise the land high enough that these areas may not inundate again when the water levels go back up. In other words, we might see a permanent reestablishment of vegetation. Now, just yesterday, I heard from another one of my colleagues, Greg McCullough from the Center for Earth Observation Science here at the U of M. He shared these uh, photos, these satellite images with me, the most recent of which on the right-hand side was taken two days ago. And uh, he, this is measuring what's called the NDVI. The, uh, it's a measurement essentially of vegetation. And the dark green that you see in the rightmost uh, map uh, shows the area of that island where Pascal was standing a moment ago. It shows that what I, and Greg thinks this, and I think I agree with him, that this is probably more even well-established willows, which I take as a good sign that we are seeing, say, permanent reestablishment of terrestrial vegetation or semi-terrestrial vegetation. So what it illustrates to me is low water is good. Uh, cessation of Red River dredging, well, this is a phenomenon that uh, I remember I referred back to the federal government having been doing it since the 19, uh, to the 1880s. In 1999, as a federal cost-cutting measure, they ceased dredging at the mouth of the river. And the impact of that is that the mouth of the river has always been prone to sedimentation. This is another one of those 2023 aerial photographs showing the mouth of the river. You can see the emergent vegetation in the background. You can see the wonderful hemi marsh. And this is where the government focused a lot of its dredging activity. In fact, one of the things I did as a historian was to compile statistics on the extent of dredging at various places by the federal government. And over half of all of the historical drainage uh, dredging that occurred by the government was done right here at the mouth of the Red River because it was a perennial problem. It was a place where sediment tended to accumulate. So over half of the dredging took place here. And so here, for example, are, are, uh, is a map showing the channels of the river. And uh, what I'm showing you here is the, the, the west uh, fork of the Red River, where it goes out into Lake Winnipeg. This was the major means by which water went out into Lake Winnipeg from, uh, and the means by which people took their boats out into Lake Winnipeg from 1884, when the dredging really began, to 1893. Unfortunately, in the spring of 1893, some sedimentation occurred at the mouth of this, of this channel, and it prevented anyone from going down there with a boat. So from 1893 then to about 1903, the eastern fork of the Red River was used as for the basis of ri uh, river navigation until it started to sediment. In other words, sedimentation is simply a natural occurrence of this river. Well, from 1903 to the present, the center channel has in fact been the major focus of things, and uh, it is still to this day the major channel. As you saw from that flow data from Sean Clark, it's still the major channel for in terms of flow. The western channel remains uh, virtually no flow. Sean's measurements indicate there's virtually no flow going through that western channel because of sedimentation. So the absence of dredging at the mouth of the center channel will inevitably cause a plug to develop there, which will then cause water to back up and then flow through places like the Netley Cut. So the absence of dredging is exacerbating the flow of water through the Netley Cut. And again, here's that data uh, from Sean Clark showing the various uh, flow patterns that have occurred. Uh, finally, the last factor we think is contributing to this is the flood mitigation uh, that the provincial government is doing on the Red River uh, since at least the 2000s. So here we have a map of southern Manitoba showing the Red River Valley, and the blue lines indicate the drainage canals that exist in the Red River Valley. And as you can see, it's pretty effective at covering the vast majority of the Red River Valley and therefore to drain much of that Red River Valley. That water finds its way northward through the Red River, 
eventually finding its way up into uh, the, uh, Lake Winnipeg. And of course, that's one of the issues relating to water quality in Lake Winnipeg because of the drainage of nutrient-laden water from farmland. Nutrients from, from fertilizers, nutrients from sewage, uh, and of course, nutrients from manure. Uh, of course, we, we city dwellers are not uh, um, immune, however. We have also been contributing through our sewage as well. So it's a multifaceted problem. The reality is, though, that a lot of the runoff from the Red River Valley precedes the melting of the ice on, the, on Lake Winnipeg. So what sometimes happens is that flooding occurs, particularly in the downstream reaches of the Red River, due to this disconnect between the runoff from the landscape and the melting and the ability of the Red River or the uh, Lake Winnipeg to receive the, the uh, runoff water. So one of the things that has been done for the, uh, for the last couple of decades is that the provincial government cuts ice. Now this device that they use each spring is intentionally designed to cut troughs in the ice. Uh, it has a, a cutting device and it basically weakens the ice so that it will break here easier than it would do naturally. And just to orient you where this picture is taken, over on the right-hand side of this photograph is the Netley Cut. Uh, in other words, that the provincial government is intentionally breaking ice here so as to force water to go in through the Netley Cut into the south end of Netley Lebo Marsh. So it's really a combination of factors that is causing all of this change. But say, just when you think you understand everything, uh, we discover some curve. So for instance, one of my graduate students, Paige Cowell, she's now with Ducks Unlimited Canada. She did her master's on the historical changes in the marsh. And uh, what she did was take old aerial photos going back as far as 1929 and uh, digitizing them to, to basically measure the open water area. So she could look at things like the extension of vegetation or the loss of vegetation over time. And uh, so she did this for Netley Lebo Marsh. She did it for other wetlands as well. And uh, so she got some really interesting information, most especially that it turns out the Netley cut did not originate in 1913, at least not uh, as a perennial problem in this whole scenario. Because on the left-hand side here is one of the photos she acquired uh, from May of 1968. And it shows the Netley cut is closed. And in fact, most of her photos from the 20th century showed it closed. In other words, it was not contributing flow from the Red River for much of the 20th century. Sometime between May of 1968 and July of 1970, that channel opened. We don't know why. She looks at all sorts of possible explanations. We don't to this day know what caused it to reopen, but it has, and it has continued to uh, enlarge ever since. So here is one of her graphs, uh, this inset panel here. The black circles represent the widths of the Netley Cut as she has measured it. You can see the year that it reopened, shown by the vertical dashed line. And the, the solid line represents the level of Lake Winnipeg. So in other words, it doesn't appear that there was any real uh, impact of the level of the lake causing this reopening because the level of the lake has kind of oscillated. And no, there wasn't any one particular event like a storm or anything that we could pin it on either. But the increase in the width of the cut has been more or less linear since that event. You can take those black dots and you can put a line through them and it fits the line with almost perfect uh, linearity. So it's really quite remarkable how linear the increase in that cut is. And then correspondingly, the volume of water that presumably is flowing through. So ultimately, how do you restore uh, emergent vegetation to the Netley Lebo Marsh? Well, it's a tough proposition. One way would be to lower the water level of Lake Winnipeg on the level that occurred in 2003 of about two feet. And you'd want to maintain it if you could for up to two years to allow the establishment of vegetation. Although the situation we discovered in 2003, one year seemed to be sufficient perhaps, uh, but it would be ideal if you could get a, maybe a two year one. The problem this, with this scenario, however, is that it's politically rather unpalatable because it could compromise Manitoba's energy security because lowering the level of Lake Winnipeg would therefore lower the water supply for uh, the hydroelectric generating stations on the Nelson River. That in other words, we might not have as much water to generate electricity and I'd say that could jeopardize the uh, energy supply we have here. So there's some natural reluctance to consider this as an option. Well, another option then would be to raise the bottom of the marsh, to make the deep parts of the marsh less deep. 
so that they perhaps could uh, sustain vegetation. Presently, too many parts of the marsh are deeper than the roughly meter uh, depth that most of the wetland vegetation uh, can, can uh, support. So what we're hoping, therefore, is that by demonstrating with a, with a restoration pilot project, uh, we, if we demonstrate that it is possible to make the marsh shallower, at least in some parts, uh, it might lead to a long-term restoration project. So what we had proposed back a few years ago was a two-year proof of concept, essentially to demonstrate techniques that have been well-established elsewhere for reestablishing marsh vegetation in at least a small part of the marsh in our demonstration project, and then potentially to, if it works, as we hope it would, uh, to go on to a much larger part of the marsh. Well, the idea then is that if we were to do this, and the, the rationale is we would dredge the Red River at uh, two places where the sediment is accumulating. We know based on a bathymetric survey that we carried out uh, during this uh, preparation for this project, that there are two areas of accumulation of sediment. One is at the mouth of the Red River, where it traditionally always has, and the other is immediately north of the Netley Cut, which again doesn't surprise us because that's where water would be turning as it goes into the Netley Cut and it slows down and therefore deposits sediment in the Red River Channel. So what we propose is we would dredge at those two locations, at the mouth of the river and just north of the Netley Cut. The benefit of this dredging would be, first of all, that we would try to produce shallower habitat by taking the dredge material and pumping it into the Netley Lebo Marsh. And I'll show you what, how that would work in just a moment. The ancillary benefit, sort of the secondary or sort of co-benefit, would be that the deepening of those two uh, shallow areas on the Red River would improve water flow out to Lake Winnipeg, which would then reduce ice jamming. It would reduce flooding risk and bank erosion along the Red River. And it would also enhance river navigation because there's a lot of vessels that can no longer travel in the Red River because of the sedimentation that has occurred historically, one of which is this one. Uh, some of you may be aware that there is a ship on Lake Winnipeg, the former Coast Guard vessel Nemeo, which is now used by the Lake Winnipeg Research Consortium that I'm proud to be a member of the board are for. And uh, it unfortunately needs to be recertified as seaworthy every five years. And the best place to do that evaluation is at Selkirk. Unfortunately, the Nemeo cannot get upriver to get to Selkirk because the, the river is simply too shallow as a result of sedimentation. So the dredging of the river would enable us to get the Nemeo to port where we could then have it recertified as seaworthy, which would then have benefits for the study of Lake Winnipeg. So that's a co-benefit. The other benefit uh, is that uh, it would also create a healthy wet, veg, a wetland vegetation. It would help us to return a lot of the plants that had been lost, which in turn would have a number of ancillary benefits. So for example, one of my colleagues, Dr. Nazem Chichek, here in engineering at the U of M, has estimated that 6% of the phosphorus that is contained in the Red River could be intercepted by the vegetation if the vegetation was restored to historical levels. So that's significant. That basically would offset the city of Winnipeg's impact on the Red River in terms of the nutrient pollution of the Red River. We could be, it would be absorbed by the vegetation in the marsh and turned into plant biomass which can then potentially be used as a crop. Remember I mentioned those biofuels earlier. There's potential there for development of biofuels. And one of my former graduate students, Richard Grossens of the International Institute for Sustainable Development has been investigating the, exactly that, the use of wetland vegetation as biofuel. You can also produce a variety of indigenous medicines and country foods, foods that indigenous people have used for, for, for millennia. And of course you can, you can return the habitat for all of those Oh, those organisms, the fish, the commercial and sport fishes, the fur bearers, the migratory ducks and geese. So we believe that it is a win-win-win solution that uh, simply makes too much good sense not to be carried out. The project incidentally has a whole lot of partners in it. Uh, I'm proud to say that the University of Manitoba is one of the leads in it. The faculties of science and engineering uh, are involved, along with a whole bunch of non-governmental partners, governmental partners, First Nations uh, uh, and other Indigenous bodies uh, have all been working on this project to move forward on the restoration.
The funding, by the way, because none of this comes free, I'm afraid, uh, has come from a number of sources as well. Uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. Well, I list them here, and they've all been very supportive of this project. And, you know, we're, we're this close. Remember I said we, we are, we're, we're hoping to get going on it. The, it's the potential for restoration. The way we're going to do it is with, hopefully, this device. It's called an Amphibex amphibious dredger. It was invented here in Canada uh, to dredge uh, by means of hydraulic. In other words, it was sort of like a suction, almost like a vacuum cleaner from, for sediment, and to use it in a way that it wasn't used before. Traditionally, this uh, dredger was used for ice breaking. We would propose to use it for uh, moving sediment. And uh, it's been done before. As I say, this is a proof of concept, nothing more. We are hoping to do a technique that has simply been widely adopted in the southern United States. There's a video on YouTube if you're interested in seeing how this can be done. I'm giving you the address for the YouTube video, and it shows a, a, an Amphibex dredger, exactly like the one we would use here in Manitoba, pumping sediment from where it's dredging. You can see in this screen capture from the site of dredging through a pipe, and you can see the pipe sneaking out into the wetland in Louisiana, where this video was made, and being used to create a constructed wetland. So this is not a new technology. We're not advocating for something that has never been done before. We're advocating simply to test that it works here in Canada under Canadian conditions. This is, by the way, what you get. You get what are called terraces of sediment. The pumped material creates these, well, they wouldn't necessarily even be above water. Uh, I like to think of them as underwater where the marsh vegetation can reestablish, where it's shallow enough that the plants can take root and grow. Uh, we, how would we contain the sediment? Well, various ways. In fact, three ways we hope. One is through the use of geotubes. Uh, that's what's shown here. This is actually a photo from Delta Beach on Lake uh, Manitoba, where they had some shoreline erosion. They put in one of these geotubes. They're filled with sediment. And uh, it's one way we could contain the dredge material for short term. Uh, another way we think we're quite excited about is through the use of straw bale uh, erosion control tube seconds. In other words, uh, we have an arrangement with a manufacturer at Riverton, Manitoba, that makes these uh, erosion control blankets that we can use their seconds, their leftovers from manufacturing as barriers. And so we're really quite excited to be able to use a natural man-made product from using uh, wheat straw, of course, plentiful here in Manitoba, uh, to create temporary uh, constraining barriers. The two sites we're proposing to do it at are here. One is at Hardman Lake that I've shown you before, that area uh, where the uh, uh, where the uh, mouth of the river discharges out into the lake, one of the areas of deposition, the other down at the south end of Netley Lake by the other area of deposition by the Netley Cut. Uh, this is one of the engineering drawings we've produced in the process of getting going on this project, and it shows where the area of deposition would be. The inset photo here kind of illustrates where the containment structures would be. One would be the geotubes, Another, shown by the pink, would be aqua dams, which are basically just water-filled tubes. And the third would be those straw bale tubes, shown by the green here. And it would be immediately opposite the area of dredging, which is shown by the cross-hatched area at the mouth of the river, it would be pumped across to create these shallow areas where we hope to see vegetation reestablished. Likewise, at the other side of the south end of Netley Lake, just north of where those islands are developing naturally, Again, near an area of accumulation of sediment naturally shown by the cross hatching here is where we would propose to do the demonstration project. Again, this is a demonstration of the technique. It is not a complete restoration because that's going to be a project that is much bigger. But in carrying through the due diligence to get this project underway, we have carried out a proposal for an Environment Act license from the provincial government. It was prepared by Sean Moffat from KGS Group. And big shout out to Sean for all his hard work. A 132 page document that provided all sorts of information that we had to collect on the project, providing a physical description of the sites, a biological description. I'll show you about that, a little bit about that in just a second, and some of the potential impacts. While this was all going on, one of my graduate students, Chris Adams from the Natural Resources Institute here on campus, was doing seed bank trials. Remember I mentioned before about the seed bank all of those millions of seeds that are there just waiting to grow. So he collected sediment samples, put them in a greenhouse at Red River College with our partners there and watched to see what grew. And you can see in the inset photos here, 
that yes, there were seeds there and therefore we're hopeful that these terraces will vegetate when we give them the right conditions. Uh, Chris, by the way, has also been doing some wet, uh, wetland vegetation mapping using a small consumer level drone and developing the techniques for actually mapping vegetation remotely. Really exciting stuff. He's been doing some just incredible imagery with, uh, with small consumer level drones. Meanwhile, we also carried out a bird survey, so particularly to look at nesting blue herons, about which there was some potential concern if our dredging might interrupt uh, the uh, nesting behavior. We don't think it will, simply because we won't be dredging at a time when nesting will be occurring. But also we found that the area where we'll be doing this work does not coincide to the colonies of the nesting blue herons. So we think the uh, impacts on birds will be limited, if any. Uh, we also carried out a, a fish survey with our, with our colleagues at Ducks Unlimited Canada and the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. And they found a number of fish species at both places. Uh, nothing that was a terrible surprise because we had all kinds of information on fish use of Delta Marsh. So we're not, uh, we're not worried about the potential impacts on fish. We will be having a fish egress area. So when we begin filling the area where with sediment, there is a means for fish to escape. And we're confident, therefore, the impacts on fish will be minor. Um, we, are, we have received tentatively our draft environmental license. It's for a three-year period. It prescribes a, an, a, another breeding bird survey. It prescribes a, another fish survey. And it may, although we're, we're arguing the, the point, uh, it require a, a survey of uniontid mussels, particularly to see if there are any maple leaf mussels, which are a a species of environmental concern here in Canada under the Species at Risk Act. Uh, we don't think the habitat is appropriate because the sediment is far too soft for the establishment of maple leaf mussels, so we feel fairly confident that it's not an issue. Uh, the idea would be that the dredging would take place over a six-week period from the 1st of August to the 14th of September. We would provide a method of fish egress. Uh, we would have a method of sediment containment. We would take water quality measurements throughout the period of the investigation. And then if we found that the vegetation reestablishment naturally was insufficient, we would be obliged to go in and revegetate ourselves. To wrap all this up, I want to just share with you the original timeline for the project as we envisioned it when we first began working on this. As I said, we envisioned a two-year project, 2019 and 2020. Uh, the work would begin in 2019 and would, would wrap up in 2020 with monitoring, which to see what vegetation had reestablished. And I know what you're probably thinking. You're probably thinking that something interrupted all of this that prevented us from doing the experiment. Well, yes and no. Turns out one of the things we had not fully contemplated was the necessity for indigenous consultation. So the revised project timeline involved quite a lot of indigenous consultation in 2019 and again in 2020. Uh, we didn't do any uh, any actual construction work in 2019 or 2020. We, we did, however, ca carry out some baseline studies, things like uh, the work that Chris Adams did. Also, Eric Schilberg is working with Sean Clark in engineering to look at the uh, whether these uh, straw tubes will withstand wave action. But we still didn't manage to get everything going again because of, well, this time, the global pandemic. So... Our current project timeline looks like this. It was originally a two-year timeline. Now it's a four-year timeline. And everything is looking hopeful that we will actually get under underway as early as the 1st of August this year. In other words, in just a little bit over uh, two months from now. That's our hope, at least, if everything works out. Now, we have learned recently that there may be an additional requirement for con a little bit more consultation. Uh, but we're hopeful that can be done quickly. We also have run into a little bit of a snag with the privatization of the dredger fleet. Uh, we have to see if we can scare up a little, a little bit more funding to cover the cost, the greater cost of the dredging. But we're still hopeful that, that work can begin August 1st, wrap up by the middle of September. And then the monitoring that will be done this year and next year will give us some confidence to say that we can bring the vegetation back to the Netley Lebo Marsh. So um, I, I want to end by saying that this is a project that is very much a work in progress. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'd like to be able to say to you that all things are looking great, that the marsh is coming back, much like the Delta Marsh came back. 
I can't, unfortunately, because of the uncertainties that remain. But we are confident we have a good, solid basis in science to say that there are grounds to think that the vegetation can come back, and then we can bring back the Netley Lebo Marsh, the, the largest coastal wetland on the continent, like we were able to restore the second largest coastal wetland on the continent, Delta Marsh. And I'd like to end by simply acknowledging all the various people that have worked on this project. This, again, is not my sole work. And I'd especially like to make a, give a big shout out to my friend at the Red River Basin Commission, Mr. Steve Strang. Steve, you're a mensch. Thanks very much. Bye bye. Thank you so much for that. That was uh, in, your passion for the work that you do and your knowledge is, is so apparent. So thank you so much for that. Um, we have a few questions that have come through if you're if you if you're able to stay for those questions. And then oh, if well you, and we did have a few people say great presentation. Thanks so much, Dr. Goldsboro. So I'm going to ask our, our technology folks if they are able to uh, bring up some of the questions in the background. Uh, question, will the restoration project take into account the varying water levels in the marsh? Will the vegetation shelves be built to the high water mark? <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, no, no, they won't. Um, because that would imply they were above water and we do not want them to be above water. We want them to actually be below water, ideally, because that's what we want to sustain is wetland vegetation. If they were above water, then they would create terrestrial vegetation. And that's not necessarily what we want. Uh, so no, we won't get them above the high water mark, um, but we will get them high enough. We know, for example, that cattails will thrive in about a meter of water. So as long as we don't have water that's deeper than a meter, we should have no trouble getting cattails back to grow back. Okay, super. Thank you. Uh, the next one, uh, oh, just as a comment, one important part of history is that during the 30s and up to the 50s, there was a a hang road that came from end of Maine and Petersville to the uh, to the Samana. Yeah. Samana. It's hard to believe that there could have been a been a road there where now. I mean, there was a bridge over the Netley Cut at that time as well, and uh, of course the erosion that has occurred along the southeast bank of the uh, south end of Netley Lake has completely removed that haying road. And but even if there was still a haying road, good luck doing much haying because the uh, the vast majority of that hayland is gone. Say mm -hmm. it was at one time an important haying area for farmers. It's not anymore. Potentially, it could be if we were able to restore a lot of the vegetation again. Right. Okay. Super. Thank you. Um, won't depositing dredge sediment to make the marsh shallower bury the seed bank and reduce germination? Well, it would if we depended solely on the seed bank that is in the marsh itself. But the the, the sediment we're bringing into the marsh from the river will also contain seeds you know, because it's draining from a large wet, uh, wetland area as well. And if it turns out we don't have enough seed growth, because we'll see that in the very first year, we'll see seedling development, we can always seed it. I mean, cattails are pretty easy to establish. Anybody who's ever seen a body of water uh, knows that one of the first things you get, even if you do nothing at all, is you get cattails. So I'm pretty confident we're going to get cattails, even if there were no seeds at all. And if I'm pretty confident, based on the work that Chris Adam has done, we there is a seed bank there. Okay, great. Good to know. Thank you. Um, it's still true that 70% of the pollutants in the Red River are there before border, are there before the border? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I'd agree with the 75% statistic. And of course, it really hinges on what you consider a pollutant, uh, because there's all sorts of things in the Red River. Um, but certainly a lot of the phosphorus comes into the river from south of the border. That's true. Uh, some of the uh, other contaminants, uh, things like uh, potassium, and, uh, and um, uh, you know, I mean, say a lot of the pesticides come in from the U.S., but uh, um, we, there, there's a lot of things that come into it from the Canadian side as well. So I, I, I choose not to, 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 uh, to, to stick with, like to throw stones. I, I think there's enough blame to go around that we shouldn't point fingers at anyone because uh, I think we all share a little bit in the blame. So uh, I, I think we should work with our neighbors to the south to, uh, to, to improve the quality of this marsh habitat. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Thank you for that. Um, somebody just said that there's some great information on this particular web website, nmwf.ca, regarding Western groups uses of the Hardman Lake area. So that's wonderful to know. So um, I don't know if you wanted to comment on that at all, if you're, if you're familiar with that. I'm not, but I know I, a number of my colleagues are avid birders, so I'm sure they are. 
And mm -hmm. uh, Western Grebes were part of our bird survey when we did it. So uh, we know that the dredge area would not be impacted, impacting Grebes. Uh, we know there are Grebes there, but we don't feel that there's going to be any impact on Grebes based on the work we've had done by our, our bird survey. Okay, a lot of more questions are coming through. <laughs> so, um, with the with the low water, the marsh is coming back very well this year. Over the mm -hmm. last three years, water has been lower and looking good this year. Yep, is absolutely. that in fact the case? Yeah. Yeah, you know, so if, if anybody wasn't yet convinced that low water is necessary for vegetation, these last three years should have convinced them because, uh, yeah, and that those islands on the inside of the Netley Cut, by all means, uh, and uh, over on the east side in the Lebo Marsh, uh, my good friend Dennis Anderson has property over there, sent me a few pictures of, of a couple of weeks ago and vast areas of mudflat, which mm -hmm. is perfect because you're going to see lots of vegetation coming up from that this year. So, uh, you know, some people say look at low water as a as a curse, you know, for farming and so on. But right. for wetland vegetation, a periodic low water is an absolute necessity. Mm, wonderful. Good. OK. Um, will you be will you be growing wild rice? This is important to Indigenous people. It, it, I, I know that it is, but this has traditionally not been great habitat for wild rice. Um, oh, to my yeah. knowledge, there has not been a lot of wild rice in the Netley Lebo Marsh. And I think it's probably because this, the substrate just is not suitable for the establishment of wild rice. Uh, most of the places where you find wild rice growing, they tend to have a, a, a stonier substrate. You know, certainly in eastern Manitoba, northern Manitoba, mm -hmm. absolutely, no question. Um, and it will establish by on its own. Again, it's something we don't envision having to establish. I'm not convinced that it would grow well here. Um, mm -hmm. But, uh, I mean, I'm willing to work with our Indigenous partners if they feel strongly that they'd like to try it. Uh, I see no no uh, uh, reason why not. Okay, all right. Speaking of Indigenous partners, the next question is, what changes to the approach did you make after consultation with Indigenous people? Well, one of the changes is that uh, we're gonna be having Indigenous um, uh, observers. Um, they're doing monitoring of our project as it proceeds. Uh, this was a very important uh, point for them that they wanted to make sure that uh, they had an ability to monitor what we were doing. And if they if they saw anything that was inappropriate or they saw any better way of doing it, that they would consult us as we're doing the project. And this is wonderful. So that's been made a part of the project. And in fact, a lot of the labor, you know, to put in some of these containment structures, we're hoping to bring Indigenous youth in to do the work, you know, because why not? Um, and get them involved, get them understanding what a marsh takes to be healthy, you know, help them play a role in the restoration of this marsh. You know, help them, you know, believe that this is a good project. Absolutely, we want to make sure that they are actively engaged. Oh, that's wonderful to hear. I'm glad that you're doing that. Um, two last questions. Um, could isost isostatic rebound also be contributing to the higher water level in the Netley Lebow, Lebow Marsh? It, it can, certainly, because isostatic rebound is causing the north end of the lake to tilt up faster than the south end. So basically, it's tilting the lake southward. And, and it, yes, it could be causing deeper water to a degree, but I don't think it could be causing the, the magnitude we've seen in the time period we've seen it. In other words, I'm not disputing that there hasn't been a deepening at the south end because of isostatic rebound, but that's something that takes place over decades or centuries. We've seen changes that have taken place over a much shorter time period. So, yes, it's there, but it's not the only factor by any means. Mm, okay. All right. And the last question is, uh, what is the impact of the buildup of water for hydro during fall and drawdown during winter for hydroelectric ge uh, generation on muskrats? Mm. We, I have to say, looking at the water level or data on Lake Winnipeg, it doesn't support the widespread contention that Manitoba Hydro is holding water back in the fall to benefit hydro production. I know there's a widespread belief that that's happening. The data just does not support it. And we don't see that happening. So I'm not sure what to say. I mean, I, I don't think it's happening and therefore I don't think, well, the muskrat populations of the marsh are pretty small right now. Uh, we're hoping though that they are gone simply because the vegetation isn't there for them. And then if we can bring the vegetation back, the muskrats will likewise come back. Because we've seen actually quite a lot of muskrats at Delta Marsh as well. So it could be that we could see that improvement in the marsh too. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much. That we kept everybody over time, but there was such a wealth of wonderful questions. So I'm glad that you were able to answer some of those. So thank you everybody for participating and and uh, in the questions and listening uh, to the entire presentation. We will be sending you a link if you'd like to view it again and share it with with friends and family alike. We'll also be sending you a survey uh, to. And if you're able to fill it out, that would be great because it is the only way that we're able to improve. So please provide suggestions for other topics, speakers, anything goes where we're really open to a lot of feedback. Uh, next week is our last week of this uh, spring program, but we have two speakers for you next week. Uh, on Monday, June the 21st, is Dr. Annette uh, Desmarais on the topic of why does food sovereignty matter? And then on Wednesday, which isn't noted on the presentation here, but I'll just make note of it, on Wednesday, June the 23rd, we'll have Dr. Jones on the topic of public health history and pandemic planning, the Royal Society of Canada COVID-19 task force, task force. I know that Dr. Jones has done a lot of research on the Spanish flu and how that is, and how the similarities with COVID-19. So if you haven't registered for those two presentations yet, I encourage you to do that. Uh, and we will see you next week. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day.